Hi, I'm Casey Bell, and you're watching Writer to Writer Interviews. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Writer to Writer's Interviews. I am Casey Bell, your host, and today's guest is John Hagman. He is the author of The Bible's Hidden Treasure, James, The Precious Pearl. Let's take a listen into our interview. All right, so you, you wrote The Bible's Hidden Treasures, James, The Precious Pearl. Why did you choose to write this book? Uh, well, I, I did a lot of research uh, on the Bible, and I'm a, a research scientist. And my job as a research scientist is to look at large documents and, and find out what might be wrong with them, what's correct and, and what's incorrect. And, and when I started studying the Bible, um, I used that same mentality in studying the Bible. And so I was looking for, uh, well, I was, I was trying to find out more about the Bible, actually to help my, my two daughters in their Bible studies. We had enrolled them in a, 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 a Christian school and I didn't know a whole lot about the Bible, and so uh, I wanted to help them. So I started researching the Bible, and I, and I found some uh, stumbling blocks, I guess you would say, some things that uh, almost contradicted each other within the Bible. And so I, I kept researching and researching, and finally, after, after quite a number of years, I I found that uh, James, the book of James, is uh, consistent with um, the Old Testament, but it's in the New Testament. And there's the primary thing is, is most Christians believe that you're saved by faith alone. And that's one line in James that says, no, you are not saved by faith alone. And so I was concerned that uh, a lot of Christians were uh, going down the wrong path for their salvation to get to heaven. And so I felt compelled to write this book so that people would know the truth uh, that's in the Bible and uh, would lead them on, on the path uh, to heaven instead of just saying, oh, I'm saved by faith and uh, I've got a free ticket to heaven. And uh, according to the book of James, that's not the case. And so I wanted to write this book so the whole world would know uh, how to get salvation. Um, have you always aspired to be an author? No, um, not really. But uh, in my work as a research scientist, I, I wrote a lot. Uh, a lot of technical documents and uh, you know but not an author that would be uh, selling books to the public uh, the technical documents that I wrote were uh, very limited in scope and very uh, you know they just didn't receive wide distribution uh, very few people would read them I'm gonna actually go off script um... Talk about um, a little bit, you said in James, um, um, you're not saved by faith alone. What exactly were, did you research in James? But, what else is there other than faith? Oh, uh, well, it works. Uh, you, you know, James basically says uh, faith without works is dead. And uh, so a person can have all the faith in the world that uh, Jesus is our Lord, but if they don't show it in their everyday life, in obeying all of God's commandments, then uh, their faith is, is really dead. They're, they don't really have true faith, I guess, is another way to say it. All right. Um... What was the publishing process for you to kind well, of get being, 
Yeah, being an un, unpublished author, um, I, I basically had to pay for a service to publish my book. And uh, I, I searched several uh, publishing companies out that would do that, that would uh, charge me a fee uh, to publish my book. And Westbow Press uh, seemed to be a good alternative because they're a, a group that publishes a lot of uh, religious books. And, uh, and actually they're a subsidiary of Zondervan, uh, which is the one that produces uh, the Bible that I like to read, uh, the, the New International Version or NIV. And so I, uh, I decided they would be a good choice to help me in publishing this book. Um, can you give three tips on researching the scriptures? Because most people, when they read, I'll say nonfiction, whether it's um, the Bible or a biography um, or just information on something, they just read it and then that's it. But I, in order to understand or apply what you're reading when you're reading nonfiction, you got to do more than just read it. You got to research it. You got to study. And so what are some tips you can give to people who, whether they're beginning to read the Bible or if they've already read it, what are tips you can give them to go back to read and how to research what you've read? Mm -hmm. Well, the, my, my first tip is uh, start with the book of James, uh, because I, I feel there's uh, God's absolute truth in James. And the second thing would be is to, uh, when you're reading a large document like that, you need to be able to uh, cross compare uh, different passages with, uh, with other parts of the Bible. And, and so having an, an online or uh, version of the Bible is, is essential that you can search. Uh, you know, if you want to search uh, the word faith, uh, or if you wanted to search, search the word sins or, or works or uh, anything else, uh, having an online version is essential. And, and that was uh, the same thing that was essential in my work as a researcher, is being able to, to look at a document uh, several different ways. Uh, and, and try and find out what's consistent and what's inconsistent and uh, come up with, uh, with what are the key facts uh, that are in the document that you're reading, the Bible included. And so um, and start with James, do a lot of cross comparison uh, by going online or having an electronic version of the, of the Bible because there's so much to read, you can't... Uh, I don't think many people can memorize the entire Bible and say in their mind to be able to, to cross compare uh, different uh, uh, messages in the Bible. And, and then uh, the last thing is that uh, do, do, the, do the review of the Bible, your, your reading of the Bible several times. Uh, don't just read it once and then uh, stop, but uh, go back, reread what you've read before, uh, research it again, make sure that you're finding uh, all that you need to know about, uh, about the Bible. So repetition in, in, in reading the Bible is, uh, is very important. Okay. Um, off the book again and going back, how did you get into science research how did you find that um subject interesting and how did you get into the 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 that well it, yeah it, it was a series of uh coincidences uh, i got my uh, bachelor's in physics and uh you can't really get a job as uh, with that unless you want to teach uh, high school physics and, uh, but I was lucky to get a job with uh, Westinghouse. Uh, they would hire just about uh, anybody to go to work in Idaho to train naval officers how to run a nuclear power plant. So I worked in uh, Idaho uh, for a couple of years. And originally I'm from Fort Worth and I had to move back to Texas. Let me tell you, uh, it's, a, it's a great place to live. And uh, Idaho has a lot of snow. And so uh, I started applying for jobs and, and was lucky enough to 
go to work for a, a research institute in San Antonio and uh, they needed uh, some people that had the experience with uh, radiation and, and nuclear power plants. And so I went to work for them and uh, became a, a health physicist, uh, which is a, a, a scientist that works in uh, radiation protection. And uh, the job I did was uh, making sure everybody was safe, working with the radioactive materials that they uh, used at the uh, nuclear power plants and, and what came back. We, we did inspections of nuclear power plants and so our equipment would come back contaminated with radioactive material. But uh, that didn't keep me busy 100% of the time, so I started doing uh, research projects on a small scale. And eventually after about 20 years, I became the, uh, the Institute's radiation safety officer and did that for 20 years. And uh, that involved a lot of research and new projects uh, involving uh, radiation and radioactive material. And uh, it's, it's what I enjoyed. Uh, it, it was all physics related, which was why I became a, a physics ma a major in college, uh, because I enjoyed that. And so the research kind of just fit right into that. Amazing. All right, so your, your last question, going back to publishing, what was the most difficult? Well, what did you learn that you didn't um, your, your learning process about publishing and what was the most difficult thing you, you experienced? Uh, the most difficult thing is uh, uh, the time it takes uh, from the, the time you submit your, your manuscript to when it's published and then when it's, uh, you get uh, a press release or uh, uh, a website the the time seemed uh, extremely long. Of course, I was in a hurry, uh, as you know, to get to get my message out, and it just it seemed to, to take forever. And so, uh, being patient would be the most important lesson about uh, self publishing. Hey, are you a writer, a songwriter, a playwright? screenwriter, author, you write articles, poetry. If you're a writer, I want to sit down and talk with you. Go to my website, authorkcbell.com, and click on Writer to Writer Interviews for more information. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this message. The whole concept of the Bible might be summed up in four words. Do good. Resist evil. But how do we do this? The Bible's hidden treasure highlights the importance of one of the Bible's more unappreciated works, the book of James. The Bible's hidden treasure, James, the precious pearl, by John P. Hageman. Available on Amazon, B, and dot, com, eBay, and Westbopress.com. And we are back. Let's continue this interview. Um, you, uh, I, I studied your, your little bit and looked at some of your writer to writer, uh, interviews and, and you're a very creative writer. And, uh, what do you think are the two primary reasons, uh, for your creativity? Uh, you have a, a very good mind. What, what steered you or, uh, affected you to, to be so creative? I personally believe it's just a gift. Um, and ever since I was a child, I was creative. Um, I didn't spend much time, you know, with friends. As a child, I was in my room. I had a karaoke machine. I would um, make songs. I would create TV shows. I would create commercials because I found it was fun. Like, it was not something I did because I thought I was going to be doing that. It's something I did because I, it was fun. It was mm -hmm. my, instead of playing with toys, that's what I was doing. So I believe it's just a part of me. I was born with it. Um, the second thing is sometimes my creativity comes straight from God. When um, If an idea is sparked and I get stuck, I'll just ask, okay, where am I going with this? And I can't remember when it was. But at some point in my writing career, I started realizing a message is more important than just you know writing and selling something. 
So anytime I get a, a spark, an idea, or um, cause sometimes a book or something I'm writing starts from a one-liner because um, I used to be a comedian. So I'll, I'll get a one-liner and then I'll say, oh, I got to write something around that. But then the question I'll ask is, what is the message? You know, what am I, what am I going to teach or what am I going to inspire? Um, what change am I going to cause as far as someone reading this or seeing this play? How are they going to leave? They're going to leave the same or they're going to decide, okay, I need to do something now. I need to activate what I've seen. So I'll ask, what is the message behind this? And then from heaven, it'll just download and then I'll just create it. Oh, okay. So see, yeah, you were born with creativity and, and you create uh, so that you can communicate to others what, uh, what you're thinking. Right. Understand. Okay. Uh, also, uh, your drive to write comes from many sources. Uh, what do you think, you know, drives you to write? Maybe you kind of answered that a little bit with, uh, you know, trying to communicate with others, but uh, are there anything else that, that says, uh, you know, get up in the morning and I've got to write something and, uh, and keep doing that every day? Um, the, the main thing, well, when I get an idea, um, sometimes every day I wake up, it'll be in my mind and I'll begin to hear conversation, the, um, the dialogue of what I'm writing. And until it's written and out of me, so to speak, I, sometimes I can't sleep well. Hmm. Like it'll just, it'll, I'll hear you got to write, you got to write, you write it. And so the drive to get peaceful rest is um, um, one thing that causes me to write. And then hopefully again, um, sometimes I, well, as human being, well, yeah, as human beings, we seem to only believe what we experience or we only hear what we've seen, what we know. And sometimes it takes gaining knowledge or seeing something you didn't see before in order to change your mind on something or maybe understand why someone did such and such to you or to understand, okay, maybe I'm not going through their same pain, but I can, now that I've experienced, how do I say something in writing, maybe I can now understand more, maybe do something differently. So the other drive is to share the other side as far as whatever the case may be. Most people say every story has two sides or there's only two sides to everything, but sometimes there could be like four or five, six, seven sides. Mm -hmm. But because we're so, this is what we believe, we never, and even if what, you're, what you believe is right, it doesn't hurt to see all the sides before you make a stand on something because some, you could be wrong. And so I write to show the other side of something. As, so people can say, oh, maybe I was selfish in thinking this way, or maybe I was selfish um, not. Something as simple as I just turned one of my short films into a short story, and to make a long story short, one of the parents, their thing was, I wanted to give my child everything I didn't have. And the child was saying, but what you didn't have, I don't want. And you never gave me what I actually wanted. And so it's kind of showing people that, yes, you may have won something, but when you're in a relationship, whether it's, you know, employer-employee relationship, um, spouse relationship, child-parent relationship, um, sibling relationship, whatever the relationship is, what you want to receive may not be what they want to receive. So lots of times when we give, even during Christmas or birthdays, we give gifts that we like them to have as opposed to what they actually want. And so my writing is to open up people's mind to see that there is another side and that hopefully it'll cause them to think differently and change their relationships with whoever, you know, whatever the relationship is. Hmm. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Okay. Um, since, since I wrote a book about faith, um, how does God and faith influence your writing? I, um, out of everything I've written, I'll say maybe one or two of them was completely me, but, or based on something that I've seen, but just about, I'll say 99% of everything I write, God is in it somewhere. If it's not, if it, I'm not directly mentioning him in some way, shape or form, I'm mentioning 
what he does. Um, I'm mentioning in some way I'm, I'm adding him because personally, and I know many people think they can, but I personally don't think I can function without him. I don't think I can be creative without him. I don't think I can write without him. I don't think I can, um, cause I also do artwork. I don't think I can do anything without him. Cause most of the ideas I get, I personally believe I, I can't get it on my own. I get it from him. And so he is basically in some way, shape or form in everything that I do. Um, whether I mention him or whether he just gives me the idea. Like I said, I'm not saying I'm dumb, but I personally don't think most of my ideas came all from me. I believe in some way, shape or form, he showed me something and I was able to create from what he showed me. Yeah, I think everything, every new creation uh, certainly has to be influenced by God in some way. Um, at least every good creation. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. All the good stuff. <laughs> yeah, all the good stuff. But uh, for sure. Okay. Um, how did you come up uh, with and, and develop the concept of the writer to writer interviews? I, I found them very fascinating, uh, enjoyed watching them. And uh, uh, how did you come up with this idea? It started. Um... I'll say probably in 2019, 2018, 2019, I started um, pitching myself to blogs and um, podcasts. And a lot of them were saying, either I don't do it anymore or um, we don't have time because we have a long list of people already and you know, come back later, et cetera, et cetera. And so when the pandemic hit, I figured, well, everyone has time now. Well, not everyone, but a lot of people weren't working March and April. So I figured, well, now, maybe I can start contacting people again, being that they're not doing anything. So one of the people I contacted was author Nancy Christie because I don't remember the website, I Googled it, but there was a website that showed you people who do blogs or they do interviews, et cetera, and she was on there. So I contacted her and I said, you know, I'm looking for, you know, someone to interview, et cetera, et cetera. But what I said was, cause I figured instead of just taking, if I give, there's more of a chance someone will say yes than no. So I said, in return, I will interview you as well. And I'll put you blah, 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 blah. So she said, oh yeah, sure, great, but I'm busy right now, I'll get back to you. So it was about a month maybe, and she got back to me. And originally, I think if I'm not mistaken, it was just supposed to be, she interviewed me and that was it. And then I interviewed her. And then she was the one who came up with the idea that let's just ask each other five questions and let that be the interview. And that's when I said, that's a great idea. And then I said, I should just keep doing that. And so that's how it was born, the oh, idea. Very fascinating. That's, that's a great, great creation. Yeah, very creative. Um, and uh, last of all, uh, with, with uh, all your writing and, and works and poetry, what about you do you want people most to remember i would say a help well no a, a tool supplier because mm -hmm. I, I i can't help you in a sense that i can tell you how to go somewhere but if you don't get up and go i can't help you you know if, I, if you say where can i get a broom and i say it's over by the such and such if you don't get up and go then you can't be helped so I say a tool supplier where I supply you with the tools that you can help yourself and that people can say, you know, I was stuck, but he gave me these tools that was able to help me because I, I know when you say, well, I'm a helper, then someone will say, well, you didn't help me. And it's like, well, I did, but you didn't use those tools. And so I'd rather be someone who gives you tools or as they say, and they say, you can take a, a horse of water, but you can't make them drink. I'd rather give you the directions to the water because I don't want to waste my time taking you somewhere trying to help you and then you don't use that help. So instead, I'd rather give you the directions to the water and when you are either ready or so desperate to the point to where you have to have water, you can now use those directions and go for yourself and not depend on me because if I take you and you don't pay attention to how you got there, then every time you need water, you're gonna to come to me. Whereas if I tell you how to get there, then you don't need me anymore and you can continue on without me. So I would say a tool supplier someone who helped me give me tools so that I can help myself. 
Well, that, that's interesting because uh, that's the way I would describe the book of James as being a, a tool supply, supplier. Uh, you know, he tells you, here's what you need to do, but then you still have the, the freedom to choose to, to do what he's saying or not. Right. And so that's, I, I commend you highly on being a, a tool supplier. I, I admire you very much for that. Oh, thank you. That's great. Thank you. And that is all the time we have for you today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Please come back for another episode. Thank you for watching. If you can have a conversation or lunch with an author, and they can either be dead or alive, who would it be and why? Oh, oh, um, oh, it'd be James. <laughs> James, let me talk to you. Yes. <laughs> what, what would be uh, three questions you would ask him? Oh, that's a good question. Um, one. Yeah, one of the things that James does not do was criticize uh, any other people. As a matter of fact, he, he kind of warns against criticizing other people. And, uh, and it's hard to say, hey, James is right, and these other people in the Bible missed the point or, or exaggerated or, or just didn't hit the nail on the head. And, and in, in a sense, it's criticizing. So he never criticized anybody. And so, how did how did could how could you not criticize someone that is writing something that's uh, 180 degrees from what you're writing? And um, I'd ask him. Uh, oh, I'd ask him. Were you the brother of uh, of Jesus? Uh, you know, one one of Jesus's brothers was named James, but there were a lot of people named James back then. And um, uh, the third thing, I guess, is, uh, yeah, how are you enjoying heaven? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure, sure you're very well. <laughs> <laughs>Hi, and welcome to another episode of Writer to Writer Interviews. I am Casey Bell, your host, and today's guest author, writer, is John Hagman. He is the author of the Bible's 